in the realm of relay competitions in, in track and field, such as the 4 by 400 where runners make up a team. Races are won and lost not only by which team has the fastest runners, but also by which team can pass the baton the quickest and the smoothest without dropping it. Please open your Bibles with me to Genesis 24, 1 through 28. Genesis 24, 1 through 28. To the longest story in the book of Genesis, a story that has two acts and four scenes that are part of it. And we will study the first two scenes this morning and Lord willing, come back and finish the story next Lord's Day. Genesis 24. <clears throat> now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, Put your hand under my thigh, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my, for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? And Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, <clears throat> To your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So the servants put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. He arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he made the camels kneel down outside of the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time when the women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman... To whom I shall say, please let down your jar that I may drink. And who shall say, drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one to whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bathiel, the son of Milcah, and the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. The young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. And then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please give me a drink of water from your jar. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly let down her jar upon her hand to give him a drink, or, and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water. And she drew for all the camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel and two bracelets for her arms weighing ten gold shekels and said, Please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? And she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. 
She added, we have plenty of both straw and fodder and rich to spend the night. The man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord and said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness toward my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsman. Then the young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. Here ends the reading of God's inerrant and inspired word. This story took place near the end of Abraham's life when he knew it was time to pass the baton and to trust God to continue to progress the story of redemption, the story of the gospel, the story of saving sinners and reconciling us to him through his son and the woman that God chose to be his wife. He knew the baton was being passed. And Abraham knew that it was crucial to pass the baton well, or it would have serious ramifications. In this story written for God's people throughout all time, a story that progresses the covenant of grace, we see that God will ensure that the baton is passed till the very end of the race, and his victory is complete, and he will return for all of us as his bride. This is a very Hebrew story with its characteristic portions of dialogue and then action, repetition for emphasis, sparse but very picturesque, very full detail. All that have God in view. And it is a transition from Abraham, not only to Isaac and Rebekah, but really on to his son that would come from them and would form the nation of Israel. Right after Adam and Eve sinned and rebelled against God, and God could have ended the entire story. And he gave that first promise of the gospel. He had this in mind. He knew what the next big step was going to be. We see then he came and he saved Noah and his family, teaching us that everyone deserves to perish, just like Adam and Eve. They were not the only two that deserved it, but the entire world, every single one of us. Then in the next chapter with Abraham, he revealed that he was going to create a nation from his descendants who would bring blessing upon the entire world because the Messiah would come through that nation and bring salvation to everyone with faith. And this story is the transition from that person, that gigantic man of faith that we have been studying to the next step, the formation of the nation and fulfilling the promises that he gave to him. In verse one, we are told Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed him in all things. Here we see God had been faithful to Abraham throughout his entire life. And now he realized that it was the time to pass the baton. And in order to ensure a smooth transition from him to Isaac, not knowing how much longer he would live, though we will see in another chapter that he did actually go on to live for many more years and was blessed for those years. He knew that this was the time to get his house in order and to ensure that everything that had been accomplished would continue. The reference to his age in verse 1 also highlights Abraham's faith throughout many years and many trials. And there are a few things in life more powerful than this. More powerful than seeing someone who has walked with God throughout their whole life and loves God even though they've gone through numerous trials. Few things in life that are more powerful than a life well lived for Christ. The examples of our brothers and sisters in the Bible, the examples in church history, we are blessed to have those examples, the examples of our brothers and sisters here with us in church. And that is one of the many reasons why things like church history or reading biographies of Christians or Christian missionaries can be so valuable. And here in the story we see Abraham was an example of faith and an example of the faithfulness of God throughout a life well-lived 
a long life lived for God. This reference to his age also explains why he did what he did next. In verses 2 through 4, we encounter a very different culture from ours, the culture of the patriarchs who oversaw their entire household under their authority, including arranged marriages, something that is very different from us. The culture of strong family bonds, the culture of rituals as well that show up in this story that are quite strange. And we read, Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all he had, put your hand under my thigh that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth. Abraham called his servant and told him to do something for him that normally Abraham would have done for himself. He chose to send his servant as his agent because at his old age, this journey would have been very difficult for him. And we are told this was the oldest servant of his household because the assignment was given was so important that he could only have his most trusted servant, the one who had been with him the longest, who had proven his character the most, that was the one he would send on this journey. That was how important this was. This was Eleazar, the one we read about back in chapter 15, before Abraham had any children. And when Abraham met with God and he said, O oh Lord, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house, Eleazar of Damascus, will inherit. Eleazar was not only his chief of staff, a position that held substantial authority and oversight over everything, including his finances, but he was a close friend who had become a man of faith, as we will see in the story. Abraham asked his servant to go to his country or the country of his family in order to find a wife for his son Isaac. That meant taking a long, dangerous journey, a journey that he had taken once before himself, to the town of Nahor, where his brother had settled, which was near the city of Haran, the place where his family had settled when they left Ur. This is located on the great bend of the Euphrates River in modern-day Turkey, and it was an over 400-mile journey for him. And Abraham asked his servant to put his hand on his thigh and swear by the Lord. To follow Abraham's instructions, this is really unusual to us. To some people I've talked to, this is even slightly uncomfortable. What is meant by this? What was going on here was Abraham was asking him to take an oath that he would carry out his exact instructions. An oath is a solemn declaration before another witness, or it is a serious promise that is given with teeth that are attached to it, or accountability. And this was very serious to the Jewish people. But we see something here that is quite different. Normally we sign a contract, we shake hands, we say, I promise that I will do this. Abraham wanted him to ask God first to be his witness because God is the highest being that they both trusted and followed. The one who would not only hold him accountable, but the one who would enable him to carry this out as well. The one who is watching over him on the journey. Taking an oath like this was a good thing, and it honored God in the story, as well as honoring God through other people in the Bible that took biblical oaths. Ezra, for example, in Ezra 10.5, where it says, Then Ezra arose and made the leading priests and Levites and all of Israel. So he's speaking to the entire nation, and it says, He made them all take an oath that they would do as they had been told. And so they took an oath. And the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 1, 23 through 24 says, But I call on God as a witness. And there we see that he is actually taking an oath, calling him to be a witness for what he is saying. Or in Hebrews 6, 13 through 17, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus, Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. And so here we see that even God himself 
swears an oath. And this is very different from the false or intentionally deceptive oaths that the Pharisees used to take and that Jesus spoke against in Matthew 5, 33 through 37. In Abraham's culture, placing a person's hand on the person's thigh that they were giving the oath to was a sign that communicated that this oath would carry on past this person's death to their children or to their descendants. It was binding until the terms were fulfilled. In other words, their thigh was a euphemism for their person's reproductive parts. This is a way of saying they were taking an oath not only before them, but before their children and their children's children. It was graphically picturing this oath and saying that this will carry on past your life, Abraham, and it will never be broken. The same type of oath shows up again in chapter 47 at the death of Jacob, when he asked his son Joseph to swear that he would bring his body up out of Egypt and bury it in the tomb of Abraham, the tomb that we just read about a week ago. Swearing by the God of heaven and earth was also intended to be a comfort to his servants as he went on the journey, because it communicated that God was high above the earth and he was in control of absolutely everything. He saw absolutely everything. And so he would cause his journey to be one that was safe and one that was successful. Why was this so serious to Abraham to secure a wife for his son from his clan instead of from the Canaanite women who lived around? Well, first we can say what this was not. This was not racism, which when biblically defined is always a sin. Race was not even in view here. In fact, God made it clear to Abraham in Genesis 12 that his intention was always to bless all the families of the earth through Abraham. Until we get to the end of the story of redemption, and then we see at the very end of the story that God was carrying this out and that he redeemed people from every tribe, tongue, and nation in Revelation chapter 5. God loves people from every part of the world, and we can say clearly what this is not. Rather, this was done in order to protect Isaac and his faith, and it was done in order to protect the promise. It was first done to keep Isaac from marrying someone who did not share his faith in the true God, who did not have a godly view of marriage and of family and God's standard of ethics. And it was done to protect him from divided loyalty and then possibly having his heart drawn away to the idols of the Canaanites who lived around them. That is something that happens with many people in Israel. And we read about that very thing happening over and over again within the nation. And so this was part of his point. And also part of the reason why Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 6.14, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers because the people that we are around always affect us. And so God does want us to be around non-believers. He wants us to pray for them. He wants us to share the gospel with them. But the people that we are the closest to, especially our spouse, he gives us this command. It was also done to protect the promise itself. And this is seen in verse 5, when Abraham's servant asked an understandable question, wanting to make sure he understood what he was taking this oath what exactly this meant and how he was supposed to carry this out if things didn't go the way that he planned. And so he says, if things don't go the way you planned, should I take your son back? What if this woman won't follow me? And Abraham responded by saying, see to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, took me from my father's house and the land of my kindred, and he swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land. And so there we see the reference to the land. This is the place that God wants to carry out the next chapter of his story. And this is important. God had promised to bless the whole world through his family line and also to have it come out of this particular land. And he had brought Abraham and his family to the promised land through all kinds of tests and trials. And so Abraham was basically communicating, do not take us back to the place that we all started. We've gone through so much. God has accomplished so much. Under no means do you do that. Do not set up my family for failure. 
Do not set up the promise for failure. Do not bring him to another place where the promised land and ultimately the gospel that it would advance would fade from his mind, fade from his memory, fade from importance in his heart, where it would not be the focus of his life, where it would not communicate on a daily basis what God had done to give them that land. God's promises had been the focus for Abraham's whole life, and he did not want any of that undone as he passed the baton. Abraham basically said, I understand your question, and I see the potential problem here, but your solution that you're proposing would be much, much worse. So you need to trust that God will work out the details. And then he told him that God would prepare the chosen woman by sending his angel or the pre-incarnate Jesus, whom Abraham had met with before, and that he would guarantee that his servant would return with the right bride that God had chosen. In other words, his faith was built upon what God had already accomplished in the past. And he reminded him of that. And how good that is for us to do the same thing, to sit and journal and to look back through those journals over time or to keep a prayer journal and then go back and write in the date and the ways that God answered those prayers. To sit and meditate on all the different things that God has done in your life since he brought you to Christ. And that is why it is good to read of other people and their stories and their biographies and let those impact you as well. That is why it is good for us to share stories and prayer requests and praises when God answers them in our church as well, because it encourages us. In verses 9 through 28, the focus shifts drastically to Eleazar, his servant. And we see that he responded with faith and obedience, showing the spiritual influence that Abraham was over his entire family and household. Revealing how God wants to influence those in our lives as well, the people that we impact as we pray for them and live out our faith before them, not perfectly, but including admitting our faults and showing our repentance and faith before them as well, just as Abraham had done. Eleazar first responded by choosing to make the oath with Abraham before God as his witness. And then when scene 2 opens in verse 10, the next thing we read is, he upheld his word and he departed with 10 camels carrying provisions and all kinds of expensive gifts. When he arrived in verse 11, we read, and he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening the time when the women go out to draw the water, and he said, O oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of men are coming out to draw their water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, please let down your jar and give me a drink. Let her prove that she is the right one by following this prayer, doing exactly what I'm asking you. I'm leaning on you. I'm relying on you. It is your power. You are the one in control. He was there to find the woman God had chosen for him, and that alone shows his faith, because before Abraham had any children, he would have inherited everything, but he didn't have a bad attitude. Instead, he was praising God that he was there to do and carry out the will of God and that he got a chance to be a part of that. And so we see his faith even in what is not said. He was there to do the will of God and he did not waste any time getting down to business. He wisely went to the right place at the right time that all the women from that little town would come. And he did not simply rely on his own knowledge or intuition or try to figure it out, but he relied on God in prayer. Sincere, dependent prayer, asking for guidance, asking for success. But he also prayed for something even more important, showing that this mission was about something bigger than just finding the right woman. He prayed that this would be another confirmation of God's steadfast love, which the Hebrew word hesed means his covenant love. 
or his loyalty to his covenant of grace, his promise of the gospel. In other words, he believed in the gospel as it had been revealed up to this point. He believed that the Messiah would come and stand in our place just as we saw in Genesis 15. He prayed that this would confirm the gospel, the good news that God was progressing to save his people. He prayed that this would make it clear that God was upholding his promise to Abraham and carrying it on to the next generation. He humbly asked God to show him by a test. And he proposed something that would have been a huge test, something that would have stood out and been very clear. This is really quite neat. God clearly heard his prayer <clears throat> and supported his idea. <clears throat> In verse 15, we see this. Before Eleazar had finished praying, Rebekah, the right woman, came to the well, which reminds me of Psalm 139, 1 through 4, which says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path, my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. He hasn't even finished praying, and God is already answering his prayers. It's really neat. And we learn that Rebecca was truly the right woman because her father, Bathiel, and her grandfather was Nahor, the brother of Abraham. And then we are told this little fact about her grandmother being Milcah, revealing that she was born to his wife, not his concubine. In other words, showing just by this little detail that she was in the right line. Then we are told she was a beautiful maiden. The point of that being that she was of marriageable age and that she had never been with a man and that highlighted her purity as well. Eleazar was excited <clears throat> at what God was going to do. He acted in faith and he ran to Rebecca, ready to carry out his test. And he asked, please give me a drink of water from your jar. That was all he asked, and nothing more. And she replied, Drink, my lord, and quickly let down her jar upon her hand to give him a drink. She responded with what was common ancient Near Eastern hospitality. But it was clear that she responded with genuine concern and respect, that she wanted this stranger to be able to have this water that he needed. She revealed her character by how she talks to him, and that she does this quickly. But then what she did next was a direct answer to prayer, and that reveals that she is the chosen one, as well as so much about her character. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. And then she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water, and she drew for all the camels. Now, this may not jump off the pages at us because this is not our life experience. We don't go down to a well to draw water. Um, we don't really know a whole lot of what this would have looked like until we dive deeper and start to really study. Well, her jar of water was probably a common type of pot that held three gallons of water. And usually when it was full, it weighed about 30 pounds of water. Camels can drink about 25 gallons of water each, which means she had eight times of drawing up water from the well, moving it to the trough and dumping it in and then running back for one camel. And there were 10 of them. And that means she had to do this 80 times. This is a ton of work. This went completely over and above any cultural norm for her. This was something that was not usual showing care for strangers, and showing compassion even for his animals. This showed that she had a strong work ethic. It showed what type of character she had. And this would have taken a long time, and it would have worn her out. We are told Eleazar gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. In other words, he watched to see if she not only passed the test, Remember, he never asked her to water the camels, 
but also to discern her attitude. Did she do this just out of duty? Did she do this begrudgingly? Or did she do this with joy in her heart as a true servant? And we see that she did. Through the little words, she ran. In other words, she was eager. She was willing. She didn't just slowly trudge over there and say, well, I guess I'll do this. But she ran. She was happy to do this. Verses 22 through 23 tell us, when the camels had finished drinking, the man took out a gold ring weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for her arms weighing 10 gold shekels and said, please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? Now, the ten camels would have already impressed Rebecca, since at that time only royalty and the super wealthy would have had a camel at all, let alone having ten of them. But giving her a gold ring, which was a nose ring, based on chapter, this chapter in verse 47, and also based on the Hebrew word, and giving her two gold bracelets weighing ten and a half shekels, or five and a half ounces of gold was really meant to impress and to begin to tear off the blinders about what was going on. By today's price, that would be an over $10,000 gift that he gave to her. This was more than a reward for her kindness for watering his animals. This would have tipped her off that something else was going on. Especially since he could have paid her any gift that he wanted, and a gift of something like food would have been more appropriate. But gold, and gold that was jewelry, symbolized something, and she would have known that, especially the gold nose ring. But he chose jewelry that had connotations specifically for that purpose. This was often used as a bride price, and this was often attached to a marriage proposal and continues to be used in some Eastern cultures today in that way. As Calvin commented in his commentary, this was offered to facilitate the contract for marriage. It would have immediately told her when she saw the camels, someone is here on important business. And when he pulled out the gifts, it would have told her that someone is me. This is further shown in verse 47, which informs us that she not only accepted the gift from the stranger, but she let the stranger put the gifts on her. So she let him touch her and even touch her face or touch her nose to place the nose ring on her, indicating that she was open to hearing his proposal. But when Eliezer asked who her father was, that would have really shown her what was going on because it was normal to inquire about lodging with people in a world without hotels. But asking about the identity of her father was suggesting that her father might want to welcome him as a guest and that he was looking specifically for a person, not just anyone, but her father. It indicated that he was there with an important task and we will see a whole lot more about that next week. But all of this was built upon the foundation of God preparing her heart through his angel, which we were told about in verse 7, but were given no other explanations. Rebecca's response was informed, and it informed Eliezer as well. Not only by telling him who she was, but also by her caring and gracious and hospitable attitude. The scene ends... <clears throat> with Eleazar bowing his head in praise and worship, giving God the glory for answering his prayer and providing him with exactly what he needed, but even more that that proved his steadfast love. Not only to Abraham, but to him, a servant brought into the household of Abraham, circumcised and brought into the covenant of grace, a man of faith who knew this was bigger than the success of a task his employer sent him on. But it was progressing God's story of salvation, which was his only hope in life and death. Eleazar bowed his head in front of Rebekah, and she heard it all, and he worshipped, saying, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness toward my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsmen. She heard him worship. She heard who he was, and she ran to tell her family with excitement. 
Eliezer was sent on a mission to bring the chosen bride to her new home so that Abraham could pass the baton to his son and his son's wife. That God had chosen to carry on in advance. That God had promised, and now he was seeing that before his eyes, so that one day in the future, Jesus, the ultimate promised son, would come and fulfill this motif or this theme of the chosen son to the fullest. And he would pick up the baton and fulfill everything that was promised, giving the most costly gift that has ever been given that makes these gifts of gold look like nothing but mere trinkets, dying on the cross in our place to take the penalty that we all deserve, fulfilling the promise that was given to Abraham so that he could take away our sins, impute his righteousness to us, and bring us home, not to some earthly home, in the same way that this story we will see will end, but to the new heavens and the new earth that will be joined together in the future as we see in Revelation. And why will earth and heaven be joined? Because it is telling us that God will be Emmanuel and he will dwell with us and we will be his bride forever. Let this story this morning remind us that God is faithful to his covenant of grace. And he will continue to advance his story of redemption throughout our lives all the way until the end when Jesus returns for us, his bride. He will continue to grow the faith and the confidence of his church and answer prayers offered in faith just like he did with Eleazar. And he will continue to work through his servants until that great day. Let this story encourage you that we can stand in God's word just as they did, trust the guidance of the Holy Spirit just as they did, and serve him with eagerness just as we see in this story as we wait for that exciting day when Jesus will return for his bride. Amen.